Welcome to My Morning Cup, a podcast produced by Costa Media Advisors and brought to you by the generous support of the Tennessee Valley Authority. To learn more about TVA's impact on our community, follow TVA on Instagram at TVA and on Twitter X at TVA News. My Morning Cup, where we have interesting conversations with genuine people. I'm Mike Costa, your host. My guest this week is Hamilton County Sheriff Austin Garrett. Sheriff Garrett was elected on September 1st, 2022, and is the 60th Sheriff of Hamilton County. He credits his love of community service to his father, Austin Cowboy Garrett. You can often find Sheriff Garrett not just at most community events, but also showing off his culinary concoctions on Facebook. Austin, welcome to my morning cup. Before we find out what you're cooking for dinner tonight, let me ask, what's in your morning cup? Uh, presently, it's a venti americana. Yeah, from Starbucks. Americana? Is it a decaf or just? No, it's loaded. Yeah, <laughs> is is that a regular choice? Not not every day. I don't drink coffee every day, but you know, I felt it was appropriate today. Well, it is, and it, I think well, it's required actually. Well, it, to a great degree, we do get some uh, people who I don't understand who bring in tea, but you know. Oh my. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you grew up in Bryant, Alabama. Is that Sand Mountain? It, it is. It's about it's 25, 30 minutes from yeah. here. It's a uh, suburb now. Yeah, the most famous person come out of Bryan, Alabama is David Carroll. <laughs> That's we're, true. we're known for something besides uh, potato farms. Didn't his parents own a grocery store or something in Bryan, Alabama? They did. Yeah. They owned Carroll Hardware right there uh, by Mountain View Church of God uh, in Bryan, Alabama. His dad was a, a county commissioner for many years. Really? Sure I was. Didn't know that. W- one of the most respected families in that community. Yeah, we'll have to. Well, you know what? We'll have to have David on. But we're not here to talk about David. We're here to talk about you. And what I find um, fascinating and interesting about your career, it, as opposed to a lot of people we talk to on this podcast, a lot of folks weren't sure what they wanted to do growing mm-hmm. up. And they, they had a lot of different jobs. They had a lot of different interests. And one thing led to another. I'm going to assume, like most law enforcement officers, you at a pretty young age wanted to be a law enforcement officer. Is that true? It, it is. And uh, that inspiration is my dad, or was my dad. Uh, it drives what I do today. Um, pretty unique childhood, seeing my dad do the job and do it right. Yeah. Now, to kind of put a little clarification, my dad didn't do this as a profession. Uh, he worked for combustion engineering right down the street mm-hmm. from us for almost 42 years. And uh, he did this uh, as a volunteer. And back in that kind of go back to how it came about, Yeah. Uh, the Ruritan Club, Back in the late 60s, uh, because our area of the county, a very large county in the state of Alabama, um, it would take the sheriff's office an hour sometimes to get there if there was an emergency. Wow. And uh, the, the people that were at the Ruritan Club there uh, in the community had asked my dad and a couple other gentlemen, would they consider being deputy sheriffs? And my dad agreed, along with uh, two other uh, gentlemen. So in 1967, Sheriff Bob Collins uh, deputized my dad and uh he was uh, still uh, deputized uh, when he passed away in 2004. But in those days growing up, when I was growing up, people called our house. They didn't call the sheriff's office very often. You were 911. Yeah. I mean, I can remember there being a scanner in the house. And when there was something, you know, an emergency happening in the community, the phone would ring at our home. And I would see my dad, you know, leaving, pinning on a badge, putting on a pistol. And not a uniform. He left without a radio, without a partner, and would simply tell my mom to call Scottsboro and tell them that he was headed to an address to send deputies to that location. And he would go on his own. That had to be a little unnerving to see your dad leave for something that that he's not sure what he's getting into. Yeah, and I mean, as a young child, you don't realize the yeah. danger. You see the hero. Right. Later in life, you realize the true hero the true courage that that took to go alone without backup, without a radio, the things that we have present day to go do what he was asked to do for free. And I watched him throughout my life do this job the right way, treating people the right way yeah, and just simply helping people because that's what he felt like he should do. So it's pretty unique. You know, interesting story about that is, is, there was a burglary at the, the post office when he first began doing this. 
and he and another gentleman captured the people burglarizing the post office in Bryant. And when they caught them, of course, the sheriff's office ends up getting there much later, and Sheriff Collins is there. And Sheriff Collins asked my dad to come out to the car. He walks out there, and Sheriff Collins reaches under the seat and pulls a Smith & Wesson 38 revolver out in a holster and hands it to my dad. My dad asked him, he said, what's that for? And he said, because I'm tired of seeing you carry that shotgun. Hmm. He didn't even have a pistol. Wow. And my dad said, well, I can't, I, I can't afford to pay you for that. And he said, I didn't ask you to pay me for it. If I don't ask for it back, it's yours. So he even began doing this without, you know, the, the what we call the tools of the truck, yeah. much less a radio. Um, but he did it because he was asked to. Mm-hmm. So that's my inspiration. I've seen him you know, helping at car crashes, um, being with him. I've seen him on manhunts where, you know, murder escapees had escaped and, you know, come across through Bryant uh, with Tennessee State Troopers, Alabama Troopers, Georgia Troopers, and things when things happen. And he was just simply present because he was needed. And it was the right thing to do. And he did that from, you said, 67 to 2004? Yeah, he wasn't very active uh, toward the end of his life, uh, but he was still recognized uh, by the people of that community as a deputy. How did he get the nickname Cowboy? That's pretty interesting also. <laughs> so my dad came to Chattanooga. He's he, he's from Louisiana, uh, down around Del High, and uh, that's where all his family's at. And he came up here with his brother. And while he was here, he ended up meeting my mom. They uh, ended up together, and he got a job at Combustion. So then you had to have a pair of boots, he didn't have a pair of boots. He borrowed his brother's cowboy boots. <laughs> so when when he went to work the first day at Combustion, he's wearing cowboy boots. The name stuck. And that's practically all anybody knew him by was the, the name cowboy. Isn't that interesting how one little thing like that, borrowing your brother's boots, <laughs> tags you as cowboy for the rest of your life? It is. It's a very unique story. Yeah. Well, obviously, your dad had a huge influence on you growing up. Um you have siblings, correct? I do. Yeah. I have uh, two sisters and a brother who's passed away. Okay. My brother passed away in 2016. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. Growing up, what was it like to grow up, you know, 25 miles outside of Chattanooga and Bryan, Alabama? T- tell us a little bit about growing up, some of the jobs you had, and at that time, you know, what you thought you wanted to pursue, or was it, did you know at that time? No, I knew um, in my heart I wanted to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, while in school, my first job was McDonald's in Trenton, uh, part-time. I also worked at Hardee's, and then I also worked at um, Taco Bell over in Kimball. Is that where your love of cooking came from? I don't know. That's my love of eating. So, <laughs> But out of high school, I went to work. Um, most of my family has are in the trades, either a member of IBEW, Electrical, or Boilermakers. I ended up going to uh, a Steamfitters local and uh, working as a helper uh, for King Mechanical. And I'd also work for stainless metal products in a warehouse until I was 21. And uh, once I turned 21, uh, I applied and went to work for the Chattanooga Police Department. But in that time, you went to Bethel University? No, that was much later in my career. Oh, that that was much later? That was later. So you got on the force. I'm curious of what that rookie year is like. (sighs) Excitement. Yeah. There was constant activity going on. You know, you love the job. It's going to be exciting regardless. But just you know, it, it your your rookie year is different than your mm-hmm. your final years. You learn a lot about this job over the course of your career, and uh, you kind of refine how you do the job. Uh, but I think your inspiration, uh, like mine with my dad, your inspiration. Why do you do this? Matters, regardless if it's in your first year or me. I'm going in my thirty first year. You know, it, it matters on why do you do this every day. And I can define that now. There's three reasons I do this job. The three reasons I do this job and continue to do it is I believe it's the most noble profession one can choose to serve. Number two, I believe in the men and women who choose this profession and choose to do it right. And three, I believe Hamilton County is the greatest place to work, live, and play. Yeah. Simply. So my 30 years are refined into those three reasons, beginning with my dad, all the experiences I had, and today why I asked to serve as sheriff of this county are those three reasons. Yeah, because frankly, you could probably go anywhere at this point in your career in terms of, of the county you represent or the city you work in, and you choose to be here. I do. I, I love this area. I love the people here. 
And uh, again, I love this profession. I don't, I don't know of anything else that I could do or anyone else could do that could feel more fulfilling. So the, I want to, I'm going to go back to your first year. So you go in probably pretty idealistic yeah. as a new recruit and What's the reality of when you come in? It, is it like you see on television and the veteran cops are, are giving you a hard time? Is, is it oh, very much is, so. is it doing more paperwork than you ever imagined? Both. Yeah. Yeah. So so yeah, you're you're in a mix of the the old guys, uh, kind of, I guess, um, welcoming you into the profession, uh, giving you a hard time as a rookie, mostly to see if you're going to last. Yeah. See if you'll wash yeah, out. Because you need to be able to take that. You got to have thick skin to do this job. Um, but yeah, so, the the veterans that were here teaching you how to do the job, some better than others, yeah. uh, doing it for the right reason and the right way. Um, but yeah, the first year's full of excitement. My, my hope, my entire career has been full of excitement. Yeah. I've been blessed. I've had opportunities that I look back on and realize that, um, everybody doesn't get opportunity to do, uh, everything that I've had opportunity to do. And what are what are some of those? So you, you started as a, a patrol officer? Yeah, so I started as a patrol officer in East Lake. I assisted in a case where I broke a, a chop shop ring on a um, auto theft crew and uh, recovered 30-plus trucks between here and Huntsville. And that led to me going into the auto theft division after about four and a half years in patrol, which was unheard of uh, to get into auto theft at that time. I was in auto theft for just a short period of time, and then I went to the FBI task force. So I was on violent crime task force. I ended up going back into auto theft, and I worked tri-state task force uh, with counties all around Chattanooga, DeKalb County, Alabama, Jackson County, Alabama, Marion County, all the counties around, and with the National Insurance Crime Bureau. So when, when you say after you left uh, auto theft, you went into the FBI task force, mm-hmm. is that you're now working as a division of the FBI, or you? how, how does you're, all that work? You're attached to the Bureau as a, as a uh, task force officer, so you mm-hmm. have the same authority as an agent to work cases, make arrests, indict cases. And uh, we were working violent crime, which is the Safe Street Task Force, mm-hmm. which is uh, a narcotics, bank robbery, uh, anything that falls under under violent crime here in Chattanooga and the area. But we were out of the Chattanooga resident office. So although you were a, a city of Chattanooga officer, you had authority outside those bounds. Oh, yeah. And, um, I mean, that, that exists today. Uh, Chattanooga and other agencies participate in task forces like that, and it's a phenomenal opportunity for detectives to go in and build relationships, but also to work with federal partners here in, in jurisdictions. And that happens all across the country. There are task forces set up with the marshals, with the DEA, with the ATF, with the, with the FBI, and it gives local law enforcement kind of a force multiplier uh, on uh trying to eradicate violent crime out of communities. Mm-hmm. Were you ever on the motorcycle patrol? I was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I went through motor school in 2011. Uh, I come out of investigations in 2008 and was a patrol sergeant in the Brainerd area around Eastgate. And uh, I think it was October of 2009, I went into special operations, uh, managing events for the city. Which was a yeah. big eye opener, and I think that's I think that's where I met you is through Riverbend. That's exactly right, yeah. and I met that year. Yeah, and our our dear friend Chip Baker. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Chip. You know, Chip's name comes up more in this podcast than anyone else's. Suspicious character. Yes, yes, he is. I, I'm just going to ask you to investigate him, but yeah, I, yeah, I have a feeling you already are. <laughs> I keep my eye on him. I'm, I'm sure on you. Wednesdays when he's county commission. <laughs> exactly. Now, now, in t- in talking about your career, you're very nonchalant, at least not the right word, but humbly saying, well, then I moved into this, but then I moved into that. But you were focused on things. What were some of the things you were doing uh, on your own time to build your career? And what I mean by that, the things you're learning, classes you're signing up for, things you're doing, or or was it just attention was being brought on you because you had success a, a bust in that chop shop? I, I mean, that that that's how I got into the auto theft. Yeah. But- I think we're always trying to improve ourselves. We're always searching for the next thing that's going to help us in our career. I mean, I've been to, to leadership schools just like other people. I've been to Command Leadership College um, that's been on my UT. been to the FBI National Academy. I was fortunate to be able to attend that. That's, they estimate 1% of law enforcement worldwide has the opportunity to do that, and that mm-hmm. was a tremendous honor. I obtained my degree from Bethel University, and, and, and all that takes effort. Yeah, I mean, you have to – put in you're given the opportunity but you've got to seize it and and go and get it but i mean all the way down to uh applying 
for the position of chief deputy and then uh, basically applying for the position of sheriff. You're yeah. asking the voters to believe in you that you can make a difference. Um, and I think you make that difference by the team that you surround yourself with. Mm-hmm. We've had tremendous success um, in the little less than two years that we've been in office. But I give all that credit to the people that work in the sheriff's office. Well, it takes a vision, too. Yeah, and that's one of the things I commonly say is a leader casts a vision. The people that you surround yourself with have to believe in you and believe in that vision for the buy-in. But the people, the organizations who makes it happen, yeah, they are the ones that make it happen. So any positive that happens out of the sheriff's office belongs to the men and women. And anything bad belongs to me. It sounds like the old Bear Bryant quote. You know, if we won, the team played great. If we lost, I made the bad decisions. Bad coach. <laughs> yeah, I'm a bad coach. Yeah. Exactly. Did you know when you first got into law enforcement that – did you sit back and say, you know, one day I'm going to be sheriff or one day I'm going to be chief of police? Did you have those visions or did you just kind of go about, I'm going to do this portion of my job the best I can and see where it goes? I think both. I mean, you always say you're going to do the best you can do, and and that's your 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 ultimate goal. Uh Short term, long term, I think anyone that their hearts and lists wants to strive to be in a leadership role and be a part of something greater than themselves. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I always wanted to be be the sheriff. Yeah. Um, You know, whether that would have happened, I don't know. Um, I I know now. But, you know, like I said, I'm blessed uh, just to have the opportunity to serve in this role. And I say serve because this isn't my identity. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm Austin. Yep. I'm Tater. What yep. you know, whatever somebody wants to call me, I don't identify with position or a title because titles are are temporary. They go away. I I won't always be in the seat. You know, that's a great perspective, and and that's something I had to learn late in my career. I was so wrapped up in my title being general manager of News Channel Nine that uh, I kind of forgot who I was. Yeah. And then when when I left that. There's a sense of loss. There's a, in terms of identity. Yeah, you know, what is my identity at this point? Well, you bring up a, an interesting statement you just said because that's a statement that uh, the two values that drive me and uh, centered around my kids is don't forget who you are. Yeah, and I always add value. So I focus every day on those two principles. You forget who you are, you're going to be in trouble mm-hmm. very quickly, and you're going to fail. And in this position, you forget who you are. You're going to embarrass yourself, and you're going to embarrass the organization. You're going to embarrass the county. That's happened before, yeah. and I don't intend to do either of those. Well, and, and you're in a very public, high public profile position, and it's very easy to, I'm not going to say embarrass yourself, but have something, an event or, or something said that could be problematic, I would imagine. Yeah. And, and I think that's great advice for uh, particularly a lot of our audience tends to be uh, people who are building their careers to know that. Don't get wrapped up so much in your job and your title. Be who you are, but be true to yourself. Yeah, I mean, be yourself. You try to be somebody else, you're going to fail. I mean, that's all we really know is to be ourselves. Yeah. Um, This might be a little bit of a difficult question, but I'm curious. Now that you're in a position of ultimate leadership for the department, and, you know, I think it was just yesterday in Charlotte that uh, four officers were killed in serving a warrant. Can you take us through how that affects, so, not just personally, but professionally, when you, you have someone in your team uh, dying the line of duty? Yeah, unfortunately, it happens uh, too often. Yeah. Uh, we don't ever want it to happen. Um, we've had it happen here locally too, too, many, too times. many times. Uh, Tim Chapin, Tim in uh, you know, 2011, he was a day show sergeant, and I was evening show sergeant in the same team. So many times Y'all I were was pretty close, weren't you? Yeah. Uh, Phil Hedden, who was my partner, Sergeant on the evening shift, he and Tim were golfing buddies and that kind of thing. And many days we would relieve, you know, Tim there at the Eastgate Precinct. Uh, it's hard. I mean, it's you really can't describe how hard that is. I made a comment about yesterday's tragedy and kind of described it, regardless if it's local or if it's cross country, that it's kind of an indescribable piercing to everybody in this profession. You leave home every day knowing that can happen. But you go out and do it anyway. Yeah. I believe my dad knew that very much. I was just thinking about that. You seeing him leave on just a phone call. Oh, yeah. And he knew that could happen, but he did it because somebody needed him. So the men and women do this job across the country. 
and go out risking their lives every day, regardless if it's a traffic stop, if it's executing a warrant like they were doing in Charlotte, um, trying to arrest someone, um, trying to intervene in something that's happening. They put their life online every single day. Now, all of us never know when our day's coming, expiration, but this job's different. Yeah. It just is. And I would imagine, and maybe you can confirm this, but it's just my thought that probably more of the incidents where you lose an officer happen on routine stops than, oh, we've got you know, someone who robbed a bank and they're holding a hostage. Well, you know, you, you can never predict when that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, it can happen in a moment's notice. It can happen in a parking lot and in an interaction. It can be an ambush. It can be a person that you're just trying to arrest for a simple offense that there's more to the story. And that person knows that. Maybe they're going back to prison, those kind of things. Things that the officer or the trooper or the deputy does not know at the time. But there's too many ways that can happen to describe. Uh, Every instance is different. And uh, domestic calls are extremely dangerous. Uh, You're going into an incident where emotions are already high and, and people are upset and their emotions get the best of them, and, and tragedy can happen. But again, it can happen on a traffic stop. It can happen. It, it happens to law enforcement officers, deputies and troopers and agents simply eating a meal. That's happened. Or someone comes in just shooting. Uh, so you're always kind of in a condition yellow, knowing that anything's going on around you could be the day that you're going to lay down your life. Mm-hmm. for the organization and the people that you represent. I'd imagine you're taught that situational awareness and you have it up all the time. You do. And a lot of times, unfortunately, that's, um, you know, a lot of people may think that an officer or someone's being short or, you know, not rude, but just short, maybe not the, the best of mood. But a lot of times they just left one of those calls. And plus that situational awareness is going on. So there's a lot of things going on with an officer, a deputy, or a trooper that, you know, the, the, the average person doesn't understand or maybe realize. Changing the subject a little bit, Austin, I'm thinking about people listening to this who, who want a career in law enforcement, whether they're coming out of high school, whether they're in college. Mm-hmm. What's your advice to them? One is understand why you want to do this. There's got to be some inspiration. This isn't just a job. Mm-hmm. Um you know, a lot of people would say that, well, you know, get a job. Um, this is a profession. And um, the the profession will weed out the ones that just come for a job. If you're here for a job, you're, you're in it for the wrong reason. But those that truly are looking to get in this this career, find somebody you know that you go to church with, that, that your neighbor. Um, or you walk in a gas station or a restaurant and that, that's a, a police officer, a trooper, or a deputy, and talk to them, ask questions. Everyone's going to have a different opinion. So if another law enforcement officer is sitting down here from my organization or another, you're going to get a little different opinion from each person you speak to. Explore that and determine you really want to do this. And if you do, and it's for the right reason and you want to serve other people, I would encourage you to pursue the Hamilton County Sheriff's Office. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> a little shameless recruit plug there. But um, we are, you know, talking about that. When I came into office, we were over a dozen school resource deputies short. We had no one in charter schools. We had never staffed charter schools. You know, we were total of about 120 positions across the agency uh, the day but I took down office. 120. Yeah, yeah, out of 540 budgeted positions. Now, that 540s civilian and sworn and, and certified deputies. But that's 25% of your workforce. It's a lot. Yeah. And it's a big hill to, to overcome. And going back to what we talked about earlier, we, you know, casting a vision, cast a vision that we we're going to fill those positions. And we developed a, a funding strategy with existing tax dollars that were budgeted to my office. And what we did is we froze positions. Now, freezing positions is we chose the ones that we felt like we could freeze use that salary money and raise salaries Mm -hmm. across the board for law enforcement. The first position I froze was the chief deputy. And that was the position I came to the sheriff's position. And it's not filled to this day. Now everybody goes, why don't you have a chief deputy? Well, my philosophy is if my people are going to work short, so am I. Yeah. So 
that's a leadership thing with me. I could feel it. Um, it's a position there. It's funded, but I froze it. I did it very intentionally. But you're using that money to fill more critical positions yeah. for your staff. Yeah, I'm at a point now that I could fill that position. I just have not. I've chosen not to because I'm still sending that message. If my men and women in the jail are working short, and they still are a little bit, then I'm going to work short also to send that leadership message that I hadn't forgot about you. Once we froze positions, I still had about 67 funded uh, corrections deputy positions, and we cut that down to about 17. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when I say we, the recruiting team that I uh, built, HR being redefined, and the branding of the sheriff's office is what's responsible for that. So the men and women assigned to that recruiting unit, HR, and the branding that we've helped build has helped accomplish filling these positions. So we reduced those positions. Um, we're the first county in the state of Tennessee to have all of our uh, budgeted positions filled in the schools, plus fill all the charter schools. So there's no other county that had done that by the time we had, and I don't know that they have yet to fill the public schools. And the charters. Yeah, and the way we're able to do that is the partnership with the schools where they have a school uh, safety officer program. So we actually have an armed person in every school across the county yeah. at this point. But we've been extremely successful as an organization. You know, we're, we're, we're under, we're not even two years in yet. And uh, we're rolling out technology and different things. We're finishing up a $27 million construction project at the jail, which will be a new booking intake, uh, administrative offices for corrections, and about 125, 126 beds. Uh, we're getting ready to open that, we hope, by the August 1st. And because you closed the jail downtown, right, and everything's out at what was called Silverdale. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned a couple times about the branding of the sheriff's department. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that, where it was, and, and the view or the vision for that branding? Well, I, I look at we're, – we're in the customer service business. You know, it's law enforcement, but we are in the customer service business, and, and you're our customer. It's no different than Coca-Cola. It's no different than Chick-fil-A versus another fast food place. Where are you going to pick? It's branding. It's the quality of the product that you're providing and the customer service. So that branding change is, is taking a real focus on customer service and professionalism. The brand wasn't bad. We've just improved it. And we hear that every day across the state and across the region. Uh, we're being noticed. Our recruiting unit uh, presented in Las Vegas at a conference. Uh, they were published in a, a written article in Sheriff and Deputy Magazine on the improvements that we've done. Other agencies are starting to look at us to see what we're doing. We consider ourselves a traditional law enforcement agency. And when I say that, you see me today and you see any of my sheriff's deputies, they're in a traditional uniform. Mm-hmm. And I believe command presence is very important. Um, when you show up on a call, they want to see a person professional. And now this is a personal preference of mine. Other agencies would disagree. We don't allow beards. Uh, we require traditional uniform, and we focus on professionalism. And that's just works. It's what works for us. Can't speak for anyone else. But the proof mm-hmm. is in the hiring. You know, we've hired three from NYPD, one a 29-year veteran NYPD detective. Uh, they're on staff now. Uh, we're hiring from around the country, uh, people who see what we have to offer as an organization and also – the Hamilton County is the best place to work, live, and play. And that's what we tell every single day to people, why they want to come here and join this organization. New employees are told very quickly, develop and understand your personal leadership philosophy and why you do this job. And to get into the sheriff's office is very difficult. It's very difficult. It's a very strenuous process from physical testing, psychological testing, medical, uh, background investigations, how that long is that process for someone? It can take six, eight weeks. Depends on, you know, how backlogged we are. We have mm-hmm. our own background investigations, uh, retired TBI agents and, uh, and others from Georgia that actually do that for us that I have on staff. But we also say it's one of the hardest places to get in. But it's one of the easiest places to stay. You do the right thing, treat people the right way, and, and you'll be able to stay. Yeah. But it, it's a tremendous organization to me. I'm extremely proud of the work the men and women have done. Well, and, and in part of that branding and particularly reaching out to younger recruits who, who will be filling the holes as, as people retire, social media has got to be t- 
terribly important it as, is. as part of that. And you seem to be pretty good on a personal level from that. Um, how has that influenced what you do professionally? Has that helped in terms of uh, growing the brand on social media, your knowledge personally? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, social media plays a big part in our organization uh, every day. There's rarely a day goes by that you don't see at least one, if not multiple, uh, things published on social media. It could be a basic just did you know about certain things or it could be about a major arrest that we made. Social media gives us the ability for our brand to tell our story, and it's an unsanitized story. I think we're pretty unique in the fact that our agency – chooses deliberately to publish the good and the bad so the good and the bad that happens gets published if it's a press release it goes out on social media as well not just to the media to you know select a story for the day because there's a lot of stories to go out they're gonna they're gonna select them i choose and give the vision to my staff uh public relations office to put the good and the bad out and if there's something bad that happens in our organization we're going to tell the story we're going to be transparent about it uh, we believe in that transparency and well, that's what we're going to trust. Yeah. So we're going to tell that and our public relations office does a phenomenal job 24 seven. You know, they just don't work bankers hours. They're woke up in the middle of the night, just like we are. If we have something critical happening around the County and it's two o'clock in the morning, they're woke up either working from home or coming to the scene. Uh, and as sheriff, you see me at the scene. Yeah. I'm a 24 seven guy. I'm hands on. Uh, I'm not there to micromanage. I'm not there to tell people what to do. I'm there to let my people know I'm there, what they need, I will get for them. And I'm there to answer questions and to make sure that that we get the job done. I think you bring up an important point about these things happen at all hours of the night. And it's not that part of your team is going to wait and tackle it in the morning. You've got your team there yourself your public relations folks who have to deal with the media and get that word out, at whether whether it's an evacuation, whether it, what, an accident, whatever it may be. Exactly. And and it could be something out in the unincorporated areas. It could be something in Chattanooga or one of the other municipalities that we're helping. Uh, we're a strong partner for the other, the other law enforcement agencies, not only in this county, but the region. So our um, drone unit uh, is a regional unit. We have a, a specialized vehicle. That was state of the art. We're the first agency to roll one of those out. We respond regionally with that for missing persons, uh, fugitive searches, and different things. Um, our marine unit on the water were requested out of Hamilton County, uh, you know, numerous times. Uh, we're in Meigs County, unfortunately, yeah. a few months ago when a deputy lost his life along with the rest of So yeah, twenty. This job's twenty four seven. So as a leader coming into any law enforcement organization. It is not a day shift job. Uh, it's not Monday through Friday. It is a constant 24-7 demand on your time and your energy. And you have to understand how to balance that well with family. So how do you balance the family aspect? Because they're, you're, you're a 24-7 job. The public expects you to yeah. be everywhere. Yeah. But you have a family. And I do. I do. I feel like I balance it pretty well. Um the job does take away from family. There are times that you could be in the middle of something and you have to leave. That's been my entire career. So you, you have to understand and maximize your time planning for time away. The two the two biggest ways that, that I do that is is I take a trip. Yeah. You know, I told my wife Pam that when I was going to run for office that I was committed to about every ninety days we were going to go somewhere. Now that could be the mountains, it could be an hour from here just for a two night. It's just a getaway. Uh, or it could be go to the beach for a couple of days and being deliberate about that. Your, your, your downtime, you're still tied to your phone and that type of thing, but you're still, you're out of the work element. That kind mm-hmm. of thing. And also, you know, share one of Mike's uh, curiosity for me. It's a passion for him is cooking. Yeah. Uh, but you got to eat. So you got to learn how to cook and uh, I enjoy cooking. Well, from what I've seen, you're a pretty darn good cook, and you're cooking a lot more than I am anymore. I don't know if anyone else would eat it, but I'm not going to stop. <laughs> well, Pam's eating it, and she seems to like it. <laughs> yeah. I got a few more questions because yeah. I know you're – I want to respect your time. One is a bit of a technical question. Explain how a countywide sheriff's department 
works with the municipalities and the police departments. What, yeah. What's the line of jurisdiction there? Who overrides whom? Well, there, there, there really is no override. And I'll be respectful of that. The, the other thing is, is actually the, the proper terminology is sheriff's office. Okay. We're a constitutional office. We're not a department. Gotcha. Um, police departments are created and the police chiefs are appointed by mayor and affirmed by council. I'm appointed by the people. So I'm the only constitutional officer, uh, law enforcement officer. But we support each other. The sheriff has a lot of responsibilities. My jurisdiction is countywide, regardless of where a municipality is. Um, you know, we're the keepers of the courts. We're the keeper of the jail. And we're the servers of the process. If process comes from the courts, from the judges to be served, the sheriff is bound to do that. Uh, and then patrol the roads and, and provide other law enforcement services is the, the, the other part of that. And I look at it. You know, we have the ability to help. We're going to be there. Uh, so regardless if it happens in one of the several municipalities we have here in this county, you know, the sheriff's office is available. Usually we're there already without being asked. Um, my deputies work throughout the, the county on a daily basis, uh, not just in the unincorporated areas, uh, providing law enforcement services. I think there may... It, it, Maybe a misconception of someone who's in the city of Chattanooga or in the city of Red Bank, they can always turn to a sheriff's deputy, can they not? They can. Yeah. Yeah, they can. Early on, we talked about your dad. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a huge influence, mentor of you. Who else along the way that, have, that you can point to in your law enforcement career? Or are, is there anyone in particular that you can point to and say, you know what, these people really helped guide me to where I am today? Well, of course, my entire family, uh, my mom. Uh, my sister's brother, um, growing up, being around them, they all had a servant's heart. Same way as my dad. My mom had the same thing. Professionally, probably the most impact was Eddie Cooper. Eddie worked undercover for Chattanooga PD for his entire career. The very tail end of his career, he retired the same year my dad died in 2004. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with uh, Eddie from probably around 96, 97 until he retired. And he's like a second dad to me. But when I say he worked undercover, he, he worked undercover. He was booked into jails and worked major federal cases um, and different things. And the last undercover case he worked was for me. It was a narcotics case. And uh, we prosecuted that. I learned a lot more about this job being with him uh, and around him as an inspiration and a daily guide. So is, is working undercover for Eddie Cooper, he probably didn't get public recognition he deserved because working undercover, he was being booked into jail like he was a criminal. Most people didn't know he even worked here. Yeah. A, a large part did, but Eddie, when I say worked undercover, he he did not do this job publicly. He was, he was very private. Didn't do it for the recognition, did it? No. Did it because he knew it had to be done. Yeah, and he was good. He's the best I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, that's the undercover work and just all around law enforcement. Just a good, he had purpose for doing this job. And I can tell you a quick, real quick, funny story with Eddie. When he was nearing retirement, 2004, he told us, that, you know, he travels. I may not want to come back to qualify for my, my Leosa card for to carry, you know, anywhere I want to carry a firearm. He said, I think I'll just get my handgun carry permit. He wanted us to go through the class with him. So in auto theft, we all said, yeah, we'll go th sit through the class with you. So we sit through the class. Everybody sends their paperwork off, and one at a time, they come in the mail. Of course, we don't need them. We just throw them in our drawer. His doesn't come. And one day, he's sitting there, and his glasses are down the end of his nose. And now Eddie's got a big, long beard. looks like Santa Claus. Like I said, worked undercover. <laughs> he's reading this letter. And he just makes this just huh sound. He did it twice. And I said, what's wrong? He said, I've been denied a handgun carry permit because of my criminal history. And I thought, I don't know what <laughs> criminal history you're talking about. But the more we looked at it and the documentation was in it, we ran it down to uh, back in the late 80s. They were booking him to work a case with someone who's incarcerated. Well, they booked him in and they were supposed to catch his fingerprints. And that was back when they did the rolled mm -hmm. fingerprints, ain't not digital. Well, they didn't catch it. And his fingerprints went to Georgia, to GBI, to GCIC, and to the FBI. Oh. So for all those years, he had had a criminal history. 
And so luckily, Sheriff Steve Wilson, who's a friend of all of ours, uh, we called Steve, and Steve was one of the last ones besides a GBI agent that was involved in that case. So we had to go down, and Steve had to, I think he had to write a letter to the state. It was a big, long process. But he had a storied career that he worked a lot of the major cases here in Hamlin County, yeah. whether it be corruption or uh, homicides and different things. And he actually also actually lived. Eddie would never tell you these stories, but yeah. um, he would shy away from it. But he actually lived with a guy that had murdered somebody to get a confession from him and posed as a contract killer. Wow. And uh, like I said, he would never tell you these stories, but I'm proud to tell them. Yeah. That's a special kind of person. Yeah. But he did the job the right way. And he was probably one of the most sincere, good-hearted people I've ever been around. And that's what you're looking for is people oh, yeah. who, who want to do the job the right way. Um, I want to talk two more things. One about the servant's heart and your dedication to the community and some of the organizations that beyond being a sheriff 24 seven, beyond trying to find time for your family, forgotten child fund. Yeah. YCAP. Yeah. Talk about those a little bit. Uh, the forgotten child fund is just our charity for Pam and I. That's our Christmas Eve. I've been able to do that. Been involved with it probably 14, 15 years uh, on the board. And explain Kelly. what happens Christmas Eve. Oh, the Santa train. Yeah. So, you know, we've, we've, I think this past year was 15, 16,000 kids that we helped throughout Hamilton County in the region. Uh, kids that wouldn't, would not have gotten a Christmas. And, and all of that's done through volunteers. And the Forgotten Child Fund was established by Johnny Wright and his partner. And they created this after a simple act of kindness after responding to a call uh, with the Chattanooga Police Department. And and Johnny was a motor officer downtown. Uh, that grew into a charity that, like I said, today serves over 15,000 kids from that one single act of kindness. He was doing it for the right reason. He expanded out. Now we're part of the, the Coach for Kids. Phenomenal uh, uh, organization. Uh, they partner with the Forgotten Child Fund to provide coats, scars, and gloves for kids. But for the the month of December, you know, we're packing all those orders with volunteers and that type of thing. And then Christmas Eve, it culminates with the Santa train. So anywhere from five to eight families, they're they're hand selected by the board, get a visit from the Santa train. It could be an eighth of a mile, quarter mile long. Santa Claus is in a limousine. Uh, every house gets a couple of boxes full of toys that are about six foot tall. Um, every kid gets a bicycle. Food's given. Gift cards are given for food, that type of thing, to the needy family, um, the most neediest cases. And it makes you feel really good. How does the average person get involved with that? How can they support it? Uh, go to the website for the Forgotten Child Fund here locally and make a phone call. You want to sign up as a volunteer and come come join us. Uh, we'll take all the help we can get. And and that organization is ran by law enforcement, firefighters, EMS. There's no one paid. The entire organization serves all of those people, uh, all of those children, through volunteers and philanthropy. And that says a lot about why this is the greatest place to work, live, and play. And touch a little bit on YCAP, why you're involved with YCAP. I got involved with YCAP because of the guns and hoses and then was asked to serve on their board um, after helping with the guns and hoses. Phenomenal organization, you know, working with kids who are at risk around the county. Uh, kids can um, uh, learn to box. Um, so we serve on that board and try to uh, outreach around the, the city and the county for, for the YCAP program as a whole. And, and Guns and Hoses is a uh, annual competition between law enforcement and emergency service where they get in a boxing ring for what? Is it a minute or three minutes? It's a three one-minute round. Three one-minute rounds. And that will be the longest one minute of your life. It's three minutes in a long time in the audience where we're at. But in there, they say it's eternity. <laughs> and if you haven't been to Guns and Hoses, I highly recommend it. It's it is fantastic. A great, it's a great evening. It is. It's fantastic. Yeah. And before I get to the last question, I, I need to remind our listeners uh, who makes this all possible, and that's the Tennessee Valley Authority. I want to thank them for sponsoring my morning cup. Follow TVA on social media. We were just talking about social media. To learn more about its multifaceted mission of service, and visit tva.com forward slash do good here to explore exciting TVA career opportunities. Austin, you've had a 
tremendous career, and you still got a long one ahead of you because you're a young guy. Yeah. And I really love hearing about you know the mentorship that your dad provided and ha- what an influence he has. But what would you tell your 25 year old self is important for a happy life? Balance, something I didn't have early on in my career. Family, work. This job tends to absorb itself into you. I would say slow down. You can't save the world. When that rookie year, you think you can. Yeah, yeah. Balance, family first, career second. And the career is going to be here. It was here before you. It's going to be here when you're gone. Just when you're doing it, do it the right way. You know, that's really well put. The, the balance is so important, and it will be here after you're gone. Much longer. And you can't save everyone. You know, but one of my favorite Mother Teresa quotes is, you, if you can't help everyone, start with one. That's exactly right. Well, you're a very humble guy, and I really appreciate you coming in and doing this and talking about uh, how you got where you are, and uh, proud to call you a friend. Same here, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here, and grateful for the uh, privileged service, Sheriff. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to My Morning Cup, a podcast by Costa Media Advisors. If you liked this episode, please share it with a friend. I release a new episode each week, so be sure to subscribe on Spotify, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts.